so you have to remember that 64K bytes now is basically free. And another innovative feature we added, uh, essentially, was, is a form of uh, data compression. Uh, we added uh, differential coding to the color output, and that's called hold, hold, hold and modify, and that allowed the Amiga to produce more colors than competing machines at that time. And also, the software types played lots of tricks and, and produced even more colors than uh, we thought possible. Um, another thing we did is, um, Instead of beeps and boops off a, a digital sound generator, we added uh, a small sampled audio synthesis engine that could actually take samples of sounds, play them, loop them to make waveforms and sound like various instruments, uh, sort of a predecessor of the current, current day audio synthesizers. Do you have an example of that, Joe? We'll talk about it later. Okay. And then the other thing that turned out to be very valuable is uh, Jay wanted a uh, good interrupt system, and we added a highly configurable interrupt system that we could uh, lock to various locations on the video screen with timing. And this turned out to be very useful when the software engineers eventually wanted to put a high-performance multitasking operating system on top of our hardware. Next. Okay. Let's see. Does this work? Yep. Uh, yeah, I'll it's slow. I'll let you... Uh, well, here. Um, this one. There we are. Okay. okay. So finally, we have our requirements. We listed the key innovations. Now let's talk a little bit about how some of them work. So key feature for animation. Obviously, we put, got the best CPU we thought we could afford at the time. And we were projecting that we might have to pay $12 whole dollars for a 68,000 in large quantity by the time we hit production. So we wanted to jump over finally leave the 8-bit processor space and jump to the 16-bit space. Obviously, we wanted full NTSC or PAL TV resolution, as best as we could do on a standard TV. Interlaced, I should add. Right. A we did interlaced as, as well as non-interlaced. We did bitmaps to limited memory. We did color compression, as you mentioned. We did hardware that can follow the CRT theme, which is the coprocessor. We did the bit living stuff inspired by the, app, the Lisa and the Alto, and we did eight reusable sprite engines. I'll talk about all of these in more detail later. So, the coprocessor. All right. We had learned, as I mentioned, that the designers at the, for the VCS did all kinds of impressive things because they were following the beam down the screen and they would make a lot of changes on the fly. And so in our second system, the Atari computer, we put in the antic uh, ASIC, something that would, did a DMA display list. So it would follow the screen and it would, could conceivably change modes on the fly. It could turn on vertical and horizontal scrolling on and off on the fly, turn um, and do some other things. But it did this on a sets of lines basis. It knew about vertical, it didn't know about horizontal. But we made that transition. So it executed a display list. It could also trigger an interrupt, and the interrupt could come in and change palette registers or horizontally reposition things, stuff like that. So the Agnes is an order of magnitude more powerful machine, which we'll talk about more shortly. It can wait for a given beam position horizontally or vertically and make changes right there. And the changes it can make are not only um, to itself, it can actually move stuff from any place in memory anywhere to any of the chips. It can change colors, it can change positions, it can initiate glitter operations. Imagine I had a X section of the screen that had been rendered and was stable, and now that it's been displayed, then I used the coprocessor to start a glitter operation to start changing that memory now that it's been displayed because another piece is going to be displayed, right? So I can double buffer within a, within a frame. Uh, let's see. Let's demonstrate that. Uh, push the button. Push the button. Push the button. Hello. There we are. Did I jump over one? No. No, you, uh, this is what I added. Remember, just, right. to, just to demonstrate what it could do. Basically, the copper could move a block of memory from DRAM to registers in any of these three chips. It was very generalized. So, for example, the bit litter is in this system. 
so we can run things just back in there. This thing is video I/O, so I can change pellet registers here. Maybe I want to do something to or from the non-video I/O. It can get something out here on the fly without needing to be supervised by the main process or processes that are running in the Amiga OS. These are some examples, right? So, all right, bitmap hardware. Of course, when we did the Atari DCS, memory was way too expensive to have a bitmap at all. The Atari personal computer had a bitmap, and it had a lot of functionality, as I described, to make it more flexible. We were always thinking about how much resolution we could afford to, to cover and how to do it. We decided to go as far as we could go with standard TV timing. So we could do 320 or 640 pixels across. Now on a monitor you can do that. On a TV you can't do that exactly. You can build things that are modulated with that resolution, but the bits have to be more than one pixel wide, otherwise they're going to fall into the color clock and do all kinds of funny artifacts instead. All right, and vertically, if you don't interlace, you can do up to 240 lines vertically, but if you interlace, you can do, in principle, 480 lines. And the Amiga was set up to do that under some circumstances, because it could align and could even be recorded. Um, and to save memory, remember... Please don't do that. <laughs> we were thinking about building several different machines, and the lowest level of one would be a pure game console. And we were thinking about using 16K bit DRAMs, so it would be 32K bytes, 16K words. What can you do in that? And so we were thinking, well, okay, uh, maybe we have room for some program, and we have some room for bitmap display, and do we have room for anything else in there? I have another slide where I'll talk about what those costs are. So, to be very flexible, we could make a monochrome display, we could make stack displays up to six bits in parallel. So we could have 64 different colors. What they would do is actually point to a whole bunch of different palette registers. Each palette register is 12 bits. Um, each palette register had four bits for color, four bits for chroma, which is the um, where the color is, how intense the color is, and then the plain luminance. Uh, there's a name for that. We then added an extra mode where if you've got a palette register covered, you can switch and hold two of those three values and smoothly modify the third one. So the Amiga could do shading effects that you couldn't do with an ordinary personal computer or video game at all. Oh, why do you, go ahead. Oh, I um, also wanted to add, some people might ask, why only six bits per pixel? You know, why not more? Uh, in engineering, you're always up against constraints. And uh, I was the keeper of the budget of how many transistors fit inside one of these chips and also the number of pins. And so even though we discussed, you know, more resolution, when I went to my budget part, it turned out that we ran out of pins. Yep. That is one of the architectural constraints that we had to deal with. And finally, we had learned the Atari PCS was demonstrating vertical scrolling, for example, because the the firmware controlled it. And so we built hardware controlled horizontal and vertical scrolling in the Atari computer. And we continued that process here because we can imagine someone building a large virtual world. And the, what you see on the screen is following around your avatar as it goes through that virtual world. So. Here we are. And this is just a little bit of the detail. If I do 320 by 240 vertical, not interlace, right? One color. I can fit that into just under 10,000 bytes. The Atari 
video computer had 128 bytes. Not K bytes, not 10 K bytes. Had 128 bytes. The first Atari personal computer had 8 K bytes total for everything. We were thinking about building a machine where the minimum system would have 32 K bytes. So with just one color, we would use a quarter of the, a third of the memory right away. If we built a three-plane system, so it's got eight different colors, that's going to cost us most of the 32K byte design right away. And we're thinking, how much money are people willing to pay for a machine that can render colors? We did a split system, so we could take two or three bit planes as the background, and two or three more planes that could move independently and we could do our bit blitting of complex objects in one of them and then we could switch the priorities so that the things move behind the trees or in front of the clouds or whatever however the game is going to work for a high res if we were going to go drive a monitor for 640 by 480 that's going to take most of the 128 k bytes that we actually shipped in the first Amiga computer, the Amiga 1000. So, once you cover this, yeah, uh, bit flutter hardware. Um, to get, to get, you know, I'll let you hold it. Okay. Um, to demonstrate uh, what could be done, um, I had actually written some uh, bit flutter routines in uh, in 6502 assembly and for it, if you can believe it. Uh, an Apple II, just as a learning uh, project while I was at Apple, but that turned out to be valuable because I could bring something over to Jay and demonstrate it. Um, as I said, uh, the Apple II uh, entire engineering department fit in one building, and there was a junk bin, and so out of the junk bin I rescued the parts of a few dead Lisa mouse, so I had a mouse to demonstrate. So uh, I demonstrated that to Jay, uh, moving you know, an object around using 6502 bit bullet hard software and mouse. And he said, whoa, this is cool. Can we do this in hardware? And so that was one of the uh, one of the challenges given um, to the hardware team. Um, do you want to talk about sure. uh, the details below? This? So imagine we want to do a Smurf cartoon. Yes, I know some of you would be nauseated by the thought of it, but just go, you know, stick with me here. So imagine we have a background. It's got some number of bits of depth. And we've got the graphics of a character, an avatar. And then we've got something which is the outline of that character. So what the bit glitter can do in the time it takes to read and write it into memory is it can grab the graphics of the Smurf, it can grab the outline of the Smurf, it can grab the background, it can cut and splice them together and stick them back in the same memory or in different memory. And then and again, in the time it takes to read it and write it. And it's radically faster than if it was software driven. Okay. Um, what logic operations we wanted to put in the blitter to do the various animations. We came up with a list of, you know, and these bits and or these bits, and we couldn't decide. So one of the ideas that um, that Jay and I came up with was to just make the lit logic completely flexible. It turns out that we reinvented what nowadays would be called a three input lookup table in an FPGA, and that became the ALU for the blitter, which allowed it to do basically any function of three variables. Again, allowing more flexibility for the software people to do crazy things. My only regret is I didn't put carry logic in it because we wouldn't have one of the first steps that we did so we had that. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. Yeah. So, I do, there's, there will be no test later. <laughs> but this is how it worked. You could take an object and the outline of the object and a background and shove them all together and run it into the ALU and the barrel shift of the Shift control is the thing he was just talking about of any possible combination. And that can go into the decoders, and then there's pieces that do area fill and line draw, and that can go back out to a fourth location. 
And to illustrate it, I did some crude drawing. I said, okay, suppose I've got a simple tank, right? It's green, it's got black trip, it's got a black barrel, and I've got a tank outline, which is shaped like it, but it's monochrome. And I've got some random background. And I can shove that in here, and using this as the selector, if it's set to true, I take that bit, and if it's set false, I take this bit, and the result looks like that. I can splice the tank background on top of a random, the tank on top of a random back, background, again, as fast as it can be read and written by the hard drive. So, well, first use case, we want to compose the outline of the character. Second use case, we want to be able to draw lines, draw polygons, if, if we do area fill. So, to illustrate that, the blitter can be used to pot, put endpoints. You can then feed it and have it do a line draw. And then you could draw another line, more endpoints, another line, and then you can feed that image into the area fill engine. It will pick up the one and extend the one until it hits another one, and then stop extending. And that can become this. I'd like to mention something uh, um, about cross-pollination here. Um, you know, there are hardware types and software types, but we actually went back and forth. For instance, I did some of the early demo software uh, to test the Amiga, and it turns out that line draw hardware wasn't really in our original architecture. Right. But after I uh, hired Bob Carso, he hired Del Luck. Del Luck knew enough about hardware that he came over, looked at our logic in line, and said, you know, I think I can take your lid lock, your fill logic, and with very little addition, add line draw logic. So the line draw hardware was actually added primarily by a member of the software team on the Amiga later on. This is wonderful. And just for perspective, one of the things I've been to is called The Art of the Video Game. It was an exhibit at the Smithsonian Institution in 2012, and then it was a traveling ex expedition exhibition, excuse me, and it shows old video games, new video games, and stuff in between, and it showed sort of kind of what they could do. The Amiga, in 1985, could do things that didn't show up in a commercial video game console until the Super NES in 1992. That could do line draw and area fill and make, you know, polygons. That was the first machine after the Amiga that could do that. Sprite engines. Yeah, I know this one. Okay. In the Atari old video game, we had specialized hardware that would build relatively high resolution objects, you know, for the tank or for whatever the little avatars were. And we had three one bit objects, you know, like we could have two tanks shooting two missiles, or we could have a paddle game. There's two things knocking around, something called the ball. That was really simple for 1976 technology. The PCS had more sprite engines. They could be a little bit more complicated. The Amiga had eight general purpose sprite engines. So imagine, I've got eight identical sets of hardware. Each one of them reads 32-bit numbers out of memory. The first number it reads out is the horizontal and vertical position and the stop position of the following object. And then it's got a series of 2-bit deep, 16-bit wide, very high resolution objects. Line, 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 line. Until the stop bit tells it to stop doing it. And that's one block for one sprite engine. And that sprite block can then be reused on another line further down the screen, and then can be reused again further down the screen. So, you could, as a use case, how many of you remember the old arcade game Galaxy? Several of you do. So here's a bunch of fairly complicated things that are flying around, and they're attackers, and every once in a while one of them peels out and attacks you, and so on, right? 
A lot of stuff going on on that screen. On something like the Amiga, that's trivial to implement. I could write a football game, and I could put two dozen players on there, plus some officials, and a ball, and maybe some cheerleaders. I have enough moving objects to do that with just this engine. I don't even need to have anything use a bit litter. I can use a bit lit power for the moving screen, you know, as all the players run around wherever they're going to run around. All that can be done on the Amiga. And we thought, hey, that's an interactive cartoon. So, to illustrate this, so the record has the first 32 bits says where it starts vertically and where it starts horizontally and then it says how long it is. So then the engine is going to start reading images until it hits the stop. And then if I have more images, the next one could go to another H start and another B start and run a different image. And then it can be reused again at another position. And then it can be reused at another position. And this is just one engine, and there are eight of them. If you were to look at this at a different angle, I mean, ignore the fact it's graphics, this looks a lot like a mini computer or a mainframe's uh, processor list for loading sectors off a disk. The concept is uh, very similar. Yep. It turns out that found a way to apply it to another domain to make a high performance cigarette. So we built a very powerful machine oriented to do cartoons instead of run mainframe back off. So, audio. There are four audio engines in this thing. The VCS headaches with polynomial feedback to make, you know, tank sounds and jet fighter sounds and random stuff like that. This machine went way farther. We made audio waveform images in memory. So one engine has, each of four engines has something high speed with a 16 bit divider so I can have a wide range of sampling frequencies. Then there's a memory pointer that looks at memory and pulls the images out of memory. If I pull a single 16 bit word out, it's just one number and a number, another number, which means it's going to be just a sign of it. A square wave, excuse me. I can make a small image for a triangle, or another small image for a sign wave. They're eight bit images per sample. But I can put arbitrarily large images in memory. They can be 4K, I believe. Right? So, you initiate, tell the engine where it starts in memory, and you tell it how long it is, and you tell it how fast to step. Each 4-bit, I'm sorry, 8-bit sample is then multiplied by a volume register, and the sum of all four is fed to the TV monitor, right? So, so several years after uh, uh, the Amiga came out, I remember, uh, you know, looking at some files. They're called mod files. I said, what are these mod files? I look at what they are. And I found out that someone had created a whole music format based on our audio synthesis engine. And that format lasted for quite a long period of time. Right. So in general, you can make sine waves, triangles, square waves, pseudorandom patterns. You can hit, make musical images. The most interesting demo that I saw is we recorded the dog barking. And so that's the sample, right? And then we hooked it up to a keyboard so if you push it here, it's a wolf. And you push it up here, it's like, yes! And you push it in the middle, it's the dog barking in between, right? So you can play four chord keyboard synthesis of yapping dogs. It was hilarious. I wouldn't pay money for it, but yeah. Um, another easy demo, if you like music, is that you've got, let's say you've recorded the sound of something, and you record, like, say, the root note and the five note, and the four note and the three note, so you've got a major triad. You can add them together, stick them in one image, and you can play the whole chord as one image. In fact, you can hook that up to a keyboard and play chords.
breaks all the way up. One of these days I hope to do that myself. Okay. There we are. There is no test. But this is how the audio subsystem works. Um, we should, by the way, make arrangements for these to be public to everybody who can. That'll happen later. That means you don't have to take photographs. Okay? Finish system in history. Um, here. Okay, so um, it, this looks like the same free chip arrangement that was used in the Atari. But when going over the die size and the pinup limits, this turned out to be uh, fairly much constrained by what you know the, what we could do with the size of the chip. So we pretty much had to after that all the features that we wanted, we pretty much had to divide it into three chips. And then uh, because of the pin limitations, uh, certain functions had to go to certain chips. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, I should. Uh, you know, the chips have been renamed a few times. Uh, in my notebooks, they're called Agnes, Daphne, and Porsche. Uh, I'm not sure about yours. And later, they've been renamed other names like Denise and Paul. So we might talk about different names than in the, uh, I mean, the original names were Agnes, Daphne, and Porsche. And that's just because J and I came from companies where projects were named after uh, wives, daughters, girlfriends, whatever. Different old story. <laughs> Oh, uh, uh, this chip had mostly most of the video pins. This had mostly I/O pins, which left a lot of the uh, data bus and address for Agnes. So, and then it turned out that once we partitioned this, we shuffled a few units around so that the chips would none of them would be larger than you could fit in the cavity of a 48-pin packet. One extra thing I want to mention: we were thinking about several different machines, and these were. 16K by 16, or 32K RAM, minimum game console. And we first shipped it with 64K by 16 DRAMs, which is 128 machines, we make it 1,000. But we designed the chips looking a little bit ahead and made them capable of handling 256K by 16 memory. Later they did what they call the Fat Agnes, and that had even more panels. More panels. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, we uh, added a uh, DMA for raw transition code disk I.O. Uh, this uh, not only uh, uh, allowed software to, to encode uh, multiple formats in the disk drive, but like the Apple II, which also had a raw transition but it just allowed uh, people to play various interesting games with copy protection, at least attempt to. Um, uh, we had a serial port, and um, I'd actually designed a, a, a super serial port for the Apple II, and one of the complaints that came back was it couldn't do MIDI. So I made sure to include the MIDI log reader in the serial port on the Amiga, which turned out to be useful. I know I've talked about the three-chip partition already, and uh, renaming. Um, another uh, a fact, uh, a technical pivot, was uh, we originally designed the chip for uh, YIQ output, which is a different color encoding, luminance and a, a, a two-dimensional chart of colors. A late software and talked us to changing that to RGB to make it a little easier for the software, and Dave Needle came up with an external chip that uh, did the conversion from RGB to uh, NTSC and PAL output. And as I said before, um, the line draw was added pretty much at the stage after Joe and I were done with the architecture to, uh, to the chips. One of the things I mentioned, in the early 1980s, everybody had analog TVs, most of them with color, and they took YIQ as controls. By the mid-80s, people were starting to get color monitors that were dedicated to being monitors. By the late 80s, everybody had access to color monitors and it became more efficient to drive, you know, VGA or equivalent monitors with RGB. But we didn't know this when we started off. Uh, let's see. Uh, project history. You want to do this? Uh, yeah, we've been talking through this, but uh, uh, basically to summarize what we did, um, J. Joe and I were pretty much locked in a white room by, uh, 
in, in a room with a whiteboard by Dave Morse and then told to come up with a solution. And so we came up with uh, the first system block diagrams and uh, timing diagrams, uh, preliminary pinouts, chip microarchitectures, what each block inside the chip did. Some did DMA, some were registers, some address memory, et cetera. Um, actually, wire wrapped uh, two 68,000 boards, I, only one of which worked reliably. I spent months trying to figure out what was wrong with the other one. Um, and then uh, we hired uh, consultants and other engineers. Uh, Dave Dean was one engineer that we brought on board. Dave Needle was another to do the detailed logic design. Um, and they wire wrapped or a large team of engineers and tech, actually. Well, not that large. It was pretty amazing what we did with the number of total people involved. But uh, you've seen the photos of the very, very, three very large TTL chip emulators with hundreds of chips on them that we had to work very hard to, uh, to get to work reliably at all, given there were hundreds of thousands of uh, hand-wired connections. Um, also, uh, the room that originally just had the three of us, we brought in uh, Mark Shu and Edwin Chu as the uh, circuit designers, and they started doing the detailed transistor sizing, and uh, then we brought in um, consultants to do the layout. And one of the things is that there are lots of modern design tools today. Uh, any engineers doing chip design know that it's all done on computers, synthesis, and, uh, automatic DRC checks, simulations. We had none of that when we were back then. We, we it's amazing that things worked. Ruby lit, large sheets of Ruby lit the size of a tabletop. We had layout designers with pieces of colored tape where every transistor tape would go. And one of the things I had to do was go in there and actually with a little ruler measure the size of the tape and the space it between it to do our design roll check. That was, that was automated design roll check. Me and several other people in there with rulers. So uh, in spite of that, and in spite of the difficulty of doing that, um, when we fabricated the three chips, uh, the first three uh, cut and goes mostly worked. There were a few missing minor uh, features in Porsche uh, and some timing issues in the others, but it, uh, we were either very, very good or very, very lucky, or probably both. So now, as uh, Joe talked about, we started the architecture um, as a uh, something as a game machine with with the Atari VCS or, or something that would later compete with something like the Super NES or something like that, even though that hadn't been out yet. But right around the time we finished the game market in 1983, many of you might be old enough to remember the collapse of the video. 